Hi everyone, my name is Rachel Dixon. I'm a massage therapist and a postural alignment therapist on Nantucket Island. Um, I have been a massage therapist for over 20 years. I mostly work with people with chronic pain, chronic stress, and or chronic disease. They tend to overlap. Um, when I first became a massage therapist, um, people's issues were mostly taken care of with massage. But over the years, I found mostly because people were sitting a lot more and a little bit less active, um, they really needed the corrective exercises to build up their strength. So people used to come in and they were sort of tight and stiff. And then their issues became that they were kind of weak and stiff. And so um, really in an attempt to get to the root cause of what was going on with my clients, it really forced me to look at a bigger picture of what the root cause was and to come up with a solution. People still really liked the massage uh, for how it felt. It was a very effective way for me to be able to feel into their body and get a sense of where they were different front to back, left to right. And it gave me a lot of clues as to where their movement deficits were. And it did help with the tissue. You know, if their tissue was tight, it was very helpful to reduce tension in the tissue. Um, but it didn't really get to the root cause, which were people weren't moving correctly. And so, or they weren't moving equally left to right. They weren't uh, meeting their movement needs. And so I really had to expand the different certifications that I had that were allowing for um, meeting my clients' needs on a full-time basis, other than when they were just on my massage table. So just to begin with today, uh, today's info is for informational purposes only. If this isn't right for you, if any of the exercises are not correct for you, please consult with a doctor and nothing should be painful, particularly the stuff we're going over for today. So if anything was painful, please do stop. The other thing is, is um, today's class, I'm going to go over a morning routine to get you moving right. And then we can go into questions and answers. Because this is recorded, um, I, to protect your own identity, please, um, I'm not going to say your name. I'm just going to answer questions that are general. And if you want to get more specific or if I'm not able to get specific enough for you, you can always contact me either by email or phone and we could set up a sort of a consultation to get a little bit more specific. But I'm able to answer a lot of questions online because most things fit general. Most of us sit too much. Most of us move in a particular patterns. Many of us have very, very similar things that kind of fix about 80% of our issues and that last 20% gets to be a little bit more specific. So I'm really excited to be able to answer your questions today, but I also want to maintain your own privacy. So a morning routine to get you moving right. Um, at night, our muscles get to relax typically and our ligaments and joints don't move as much and they tend to get a little bit stiffer. So <clears throat> the routine for today is designed to get your joints and your ligaments sort of moving and warmed up for your day. Um, and this is another thing, if people wake up and they're like really stiff and, um, and they have problems in the morning, you tend to think their issues are with their ligaments, okay? When someone is like, I wake up and I feel great, but throughout the day, my back starts to hurt and my shoulder starts to hurt and all these things hurt more at the end of the day, you tend to think the issue is mostly in their muscles. And when people go, you know, I'm in a little bit of pain all day, but then I go into bed and man, that is when, you know, my shoulder really, really starts to hurt or, you know, the pain down my leg really starts to hurt. A lot of times um, that type of a pain is coming from a referred nerve pain um, because um, the nervous system is tied to our brain and our, our brain is less busy as we go to bed. And so you become more aware of the nerve issues at night. So those are just different patterns that people tend to have. It's not that they don't overlap in all three areas, but that's like 
the cheat sheet of what's going on with your body. Okay, so I'm gonna go over a handful of different ways that we could work the different joints that most people find beneficial to get their day going. But we could do any of these, well, almost any of these sort of lying down or sitting up or standing up. And they're all just a little bit different um, and so I'll go over a couple of them in different ways that you could adjust them, um, but know that the most effective way to do any of these is to be able to make it fit into your schedule. And so the best way to actually accomplish it is to, to make it efficient for you and not have a specific time that you have to go to a specific place in a specific a specific position. We want to sort of incorporate this into our general everyday routine and I'll include what I might do for my day. And I apologize, my, my dog is barking upstairs. I'm hoping that he isn't much of an interruption. Um, so the most efficient way is if you can just include this, um, if you can just include this into your day, I'll show you how you could do the different exercises in the different positions um, and whatever works best for you is, is the right one, but also um, different ways that you might incorporate into your day as you're already getting up. The other thing is I did put them in a particular order that is effective for a lot of people, but you could put them in any order that you want to, okay? These are all generally to get your joints warmed up, to get your ligaments warmed up, to get your body moving from left to right and warm yourself up a little bit for the day. So the exercises that we're gonna go over are the ankle and, and the sheet that you guys would have been emailed um, I went over the general exercises right here, and then there's a link to each of them. So I am going to show you what they are, and the ideal world, you would be able to um, do them on your own if you go, oh, gee, yes, she said the ankle ones, but what were they? Obviously, if you print it out, you wouldn't have it, but if you go to the document that was emailed and click on it, it's a live link that you could click and say, oh yeah, that's what the ankle point flexes were, okay? Um, so what we're going to do is the ankle point flexes, um, and you can do it for your hands too. And this is really gonna warm up your ankle. And theoretically, if you did it exactly as they have it, you warm up all the muscles from your knee down. You have more bones and more muscles from your knee down than you do in any other part of your body. And so on a lot of times we walk either with our feet out too much or our feet in too much or one of the other. And so this is a great way to get our ankles and joints warmed up. Then we're gonna do shoulder shrugs and then a calf stretch. Now, the information that I gave you on calf stretch is Katie Bowman's. She is my one of my favorite people for, for the older, uh, well, she's good for all ages, but when it comes to older people and mobility, she's one of my favorite people. Um, and this is one of her calf stretches. There's multiple ways of doing it. She goes over a couple of them, but I'll show you how you could do two at one time or one at a time. And then an Agoscu sitting twist, an overhead reach and cats and dogs. And this is really going to get our shoulders moving, our ankles and hands moving, our calf stretched and kind of getting our bodies used to twisting in each direction you know, stretching our shoulders back and our upper back. And then cats and dogs really gets flexion and extension of the spine. And this is a really great sort of warm up that, like I said, can be put very, very easily where you don't even have to interrupt your day to get started with it. So let's get going because I know some of you guys have to leave. So the ankle point flexes. If I were to most easily put this into my day, I would do these before I even got up in my day. And let me show you what they were. So if I was lying in bed and I'm waking up and I'm, you know, hearing the birds or I'm hearing the plows outside. Can you guys see me? Yes. And I'm waking, you could do it in a couple of ways. The official Agoski one is to have 
this leg be active, bring this leg up, which is not efficient if you're in bed, and to make circles in one direction, circles in the other direction, and then pointing and flexing. And this is going to produce flexion and extension in our hips and activity of all the muscles lower here. But if you're just doing it mostly to get your uh, ankles really warmed up, you could lie here and you could do circles out and you could even do your hands too and circles in and pointing and flexing and you're gonna probably hear pops and cracks and all sorts of things are going to happen as you get started for your day. And then I would get up and I have shoulder shrugs, okay? So if it were me, I'd probably walk downstairs. I take my temperature every day to make sure I don't have one because of COVID. I turn the coffee maker on and I would probably do my shoulder shrugs and my calf stretches next. So with the shoulders, okay, shoulder shrugs are theoretically taking our shoulders and rolling them forwards. And this really kind of takes our scapulas and our shoulders and reminds them to move. And then we're going to roll our shoulders backwards. Now, most of us spend too much time rolled forward. So if you were going to spend more time focusing on either forwards or backwards, um, you would probably want to lift those shoulders up, bring them back and bring them back. So focusing on sort of reminding the, the chest to open up a little bit and the shoulders to move back. But it's good to have your shoulders just generally move. Even people with rotator cuff issues tend to not have discomfort with this one, okay? Calf stretches. Um, multiple ways you can do calf stretches. I included Katie Bowman's because I like it so much, okay? But you could use uh, exercises on stairs and, all, and everything else. Katie almost always uses a half foam roller. I don't know if you can see this. It's 36 inches. They have 12 inch ones too. It is a half foam roller. This is a squishy one. It's a little less um, uh, deep a stretch as the other ones. But even if something like this were too, too much of a stretch for you, you could start with rolled towels, okay? There is an angle to it, so you don't really want too much of a block, okay? But it's going to be that you, are, you have this down. I'm going to put my feet on it, okay? My, let me show you this way. Um, so for me, I might do it when I'm, when I'm like getting my coffee and taking my temperature. Okay. So now I have my, um, my feet are hip width apart. Okay. My toes are pointing forward. It looked angled, but I'm actually angled on the ground, not really angled on the thing. Okay. It's, I'll show you from the side. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to have my center of gravity sort of over my ankles and I'm feeling a stretch in both calves okay now let me show you what this looks like on the side now many of you guys so it looks like this okay so this is actually quite a decent stretch and i'm tight so do you see how i'm wanting to shift my pelvis forward i'm shifting my pelvis forward because this makes it less tight actually and let me show you what else you can do if balance is any issue always, always safety first. You can absolutely be on a roll towel or be on this and I have something that I can have my hands on so I can always make sure that I'm stable or I could be against a wall, okay? This is actually, even though it's a soft roller, I'm a little tight today so I'm shifting my hips forward and this is making it a little bit less actually a stretch on my calves, which is surprising, right? So right now my knees are straight and this is going to get my gastrocnemius. This is what we think of as the major calf muscle up here. But now if I bend my knees a little bit, okay, I'm actually gonna have to bend at my hips. This is going to get a stretch into my soleus, 
which is the full calf. It's the underneath one. It goes from the knees down. Now, two ways that you can stretch your calf. You could stretch your calf that way. You could do the other way that Katie has, which is to also test what your, um, actually, let me put this down so you can see it a little bit better. So if I was like, I'm gonna go out for a walk, it's great to start by getting your calves done, but if I'm saying, hmm, what should my stride length be today? Because um, I'm, I'm gonna go for a walk. This is the way that you can test your stride length. So now I'm going to have my ankle here. I'm gonna hold on to here to be safe, okay? I'm gonna see how far forward I can bring this foot without having to shift my hips forward. Let me actually now lift it up so you can see me shift my hips forward. So I want to be able to have the length in my back leg while getting this guy forward and keeping my center of gravity over my back ankle, okay? And this shows me, and then see how much I have to bounce or, or have true space in that back line. So for me, I'm really tight today. And so you can see, I can't take a really long stride today without having to shift my hips forward, use my hip flexors and get into my back. So this is a really great way to just not only stretch your calves, but to get an awareness of how long a stride today's stride should be. Okay, well, most people's issues that they end up going to a podiatrist for, many of them have an element that is coming from taking an improper stride length. Lots of other things can go wrong, but one of the initial things is, is they're, they're having an improper stride length and they're trying to take too long a stride versus the appropriate stride length. Okay, so sitting twists. Any questions? on the stuff that I went over so far. Okay. Well, you guys can also, cause I'm gonna show you a couple different ways you can do it. Now I've made my coffee. I'm going to sit and drink my coffee, maybe check my emails. And I'm noticing that my back is a little bit tight. So I'm gonna do a twist. Now, a lot of times if we're on the computer or we're writing or we're reading or we're watching TV or whatever, even driving, we're going to have an element where we have a predominant side. For me, I am predominantly right-handed. I massage on both sides of the body. I am still significantly more dominated with my right hand twisting to the left than equally. So for me, this one, okay, which is my pelvis is sitting, my knees are hip width apart, my feet are hip width apart. I'm not going to lift up on my seat, on my pelvis, but I'm gonna twist my back and my body, okay? I'm gonna place my hand at my knee. This just helps twist me. I'm gonna place my other hand on the chair and I'm gonna allow my head to rotate and look in this direction and kind of twist as much as I can without lifting up on my seat. And this is going to do a stretch into your back, but also ask your muscles to work a little hard. And you would just hold this for 30 seconds to a minute maybe. And then we're going to do the other. Because I twist all day long this way, that one's easy for me. This one feels odd, right? So I'm gonna take my hand here and my hand here. And now I'm twisting, twisting my shoulders, twisting my whole back to look that way. All right, and this is one, introducing movement in both directions, but it's getting just a little bit of a twist into my back. Um, overhead stretch, okay? This is about when we look at our back, let me go in this direction. When we look at our back, okay? We want to be sitting, we want to be sitting upright, okay? But a lot of our movement comes from our low back. And a lot of times our upper back gets stuck like in a forward position. And say we're stuck in this forward position and we're trying to lift up for something on the top shelf. Well, we're gonna stay stuck in this forward position and then I'm gonna overuse my shoulders and maybe injure it as we're trying to get up. What we want to do is remind that upper back to extend. So this is flexion, this 
sitting more upright is extension. So we want to be able to remind our upper back and activate those muscles to remember how to work. Now this one can potentially bother your shoulder if you have a shoulder uh, rotator cuff or whatever. So none of these are meant to be painful. All of them are meant to be correct, but they can always be adjusted a little bit to what's comfortable for you. Nothing should be painful, okay? So now I'm going to have my elbows locked. I'm gonna come right here, okay? And actually you can come in like this. It gives you a little bit of a stretch to your wrist, okay? I'm gonna, I'm gonna lean forward a little bit because I want a little bit of an anterior tilt on my pelvis. I'm gonna bring this as much up to my ears as I can. And then I'm going to bring my back to extend. Okay, so now I'm having a little bit of a stretch into my arms and I'm having a lot of whew, activity into that upper back. Okay, there's no pain into my shoulders because I would stop if that happened. But this is really asking my hips to stay flexed while my upper back to extend. And this is really great. And then we're gonna do a cat and dog. So a cat and dog is really saying, I'm going to bring my whole back through flexion and extension, okay? A lot of us have flexion in one section and extension in another, and we don't really go through full range of motion for the whole thing. So we're gonna go everywhere from our sacrum and our tailbone all the way up to our neck and our eyes. And our eyes are supposed to do the movement first. So we're going to, I'm gonna go into flexion now. I'm gonna tilt my pelvis back and I'm gonna go into a big C and my eyes are looking down and then I'm going to be looking up. And I'm going to look up and I'm going to make my back into an opposite of a C. So I'm seeing the other direction. And I'm just going to move through flexion and extension. And this is really warming up your back and reminding all the different parts that it could work. Now, many of those things could be done all uh, either sitting or all lying down. So say you got up you made your coffee and you're sitting down and you're like, you know what, I didn't do it. What am I going to do? Well, if your hips aren't too tight, it can be really great to bring your knee up like this. Okay. So now if, if your knee is way up like this, when you go to sit here, this is maybe not the right one for you. Right. But if you can sit here and you can get your knee open like this, I'm going to now stretch into my hip while I'm also going to get my ankle circles. I can't really get into a calf stretch with this. Um, so I would do that maybe when I go to stand up, but now I'm gonna do my shoulder rolls. I'm going to do my overhead extension. I can do my twisting. I can do my cats and dogs. And did I miss anything? Yeah, so then I would maybe just do a calf stretch when I was getting up and doing some different stuff. Um, many of these things can also be done standing. So I'm standing waiting for my coffee or tea or warm milk or something in the morning. And let me lift this up so you can see. So I am simply um, going to do my calf stretch. Now, when you go to stand up and do the overhead, right, you want to make sure that there is a slight tilt forward of the pelvis, because then we're gonna have extension on top of an anterior pelvis. So I'm gonna bring this right here, and now I'm gonna look up and I'm getting an overhead stretch. Of course, we can have the shoulder rolls. Uh, you can even, do the, the, the ankle point flexes, but unless you have really good balance, I would probably be either down on the ground or some element of sitting for that. So really, these are all very, very easy ones that can be easily added into 
your day in whatever moment. They don't even have to be a specific time because for the most part, everyone's gonna benefit from these. And if you are someone that has that 20% that needs a little bit of extra, I would rather uh, you put special a time for that one piece rather than you know this whole thing and then it gets too long. Any questions about the exercises that we already um, went over or ways that you might um, be able to add it into your day? And then do you have any postural questions for me that I might be able to answer? Quick, quick, quick. Hello. Hi. 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 <laughs> this is Florence and Olivia. Here, why don't you sit right here? Um, and uh, we do have a question. Yes. Should we be doing this or can we do this, that these exercises with shoes on? Or Absol should we uh, yeah, have a shoe? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Awesome. So um, any of the exercises could be done. Let me just look at it real quick. Yes, you absolutely can. There are sometimes benefits to a few exercises that you might have uh, shoes off, but that's a little bit more if we were specifically doing some foot exercises to like get your foot wiggling. I've done three or four okay. foot classes for the library. They're in the library um, uh, um, YouTube stuff. And they will really talk about like spreading the toes, wiggling the toes. Those are really great for you as well. Um, okay, uh, sorry, I was reading something. Um, so they would be really great too, and they're harder for shoes, but absolutely shoes would be okay. In general, the issue that shoes sometimes provide is that uh, the feet are meant to be flexible like the hands, and when you put someone in a really stiff shoe, you work the ankle a lot, and you don't work the foot a lot. Um, but I hadn't really brought up specific foot stuff. So if you were saying, oh, I really have foot issues, I want to address foot issues, um, then you would uh, really want to look at the foot and how the foot went versus this. But other than that, yes, for the stuff that I gave you today, um, shoes are absolutely fine. So someone asked a question. Did I answer your question first? Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so someone asked- Yes, you did. Yep. Yeah. All right. Someone asked a question on how to improve overall tightness all along left side due to a slight tear and labrum of left hip. So this is someone who it would be easier if I actually like had them on the massage table because then I get clues as to what's going on. But theoretically, um, bodies are like houses sort of okay um uh houses have a basement and then they have like a first floor and a second floor and a maybe a third floor okay our feet are really like our basement and this is why feet are really important because if we already have a structural defect in our basement where our basement's cracked or our basement is bent then we know all the next floors above it are going to have issues as well, right? So, and in other classes, we've talked about how there are um, joints that are meant to be flexible and joints that are meant to be um, stable, right? And they alternate. So um, we have the feet, which is really the basement. The knees get to be the scapegoat between um, Okay, sorry, I'm gonna continue this and then I'll try to get a little bit more specific. So then you have the next floor is really like the hips, right? And then the next floor is really the shoulders because all of those are meant to be the mobile ones. And the scapegoat between the two are really like the knees and um, the low back and stuff because they're meant to be um, stable. So the issue with one whole side could be many things, but a lot of times it's what compensations you are having according to the rest of it. So compensations are a little bit tricky because they're how your brain and your body will, uh, will compensate. Um, and the good part about our body compensating is that it does it. Um, it wants to protect you. It's like, how can we still 
reach for that thing? How can I still run away from that bear if we needed to? Okay, so initially those compensations start as a way to accomplish the activity without accomplish without having too much pain when you have say an injury related to it. Um, when you have uh, a compensation though, and it happens too long, our body gets mm -hmm. used to it and then it, it compensates too much. Oh, no. So in theory, yeah. okay, if you if someone had a slight tear and labrum of left hip, you are probably going to want to work on creating a really stable back, creating a flexible hip as long as it didn't cause too much discomfort and to make sure you were moving correctly. It's probably what's going to get your, get your both the proper stability into that area and also um, have your body working correctly. Um, many people have labral tears, shoulder tears, neck issues, and all sorts of other things, uh, bulging discs in their back. Not everyone has pain associated with it. That's not to say that the, the labral tear or the bulging disc or the tear in the shoulder is not, is not painful. It's not saying that you're making it up, but pain is a symptom of a lot of both chemical and physical feelings that you feel that your brain then decides what it is. Is this okay? Am I going to burn myself if I touch something? Or is it more that, um, that uh, it's a sensation that I don't know what to do with, so I'm going to fill it with pain. So there's a lot of different things that you can do, but creating the stability that your hip would be stable um, is probably the best thing you're going to do if you're not going to have uh, surgery on it. And even with surgery, if you don't correct those things, you're likely to still be in pain probably. So any other questions? <clears throat> so, um, as I wait to see if anyone has a method, a, a thing. A lot of times um, postural work can be very helpful to people because it looks to stack the body up correctly. And when you have a stacked basement, um, as, uh, you have a stacked basement, then you have a stacked first floor, then you have a stacked second floor, even if you had a crack in that basement, like, like a foot issue, or you had a little bit of something like a labral tear, you're potentially going to be able to move and not cause as much pain as you had before. And in part, that's because you are more equally moving left to right and your focus of sensation is a little bit different. So say you have, uh, little cartilage left in your knee because, um, you know, you're rubbing in a particular way. Okay. If you, but, but you were always say, um, and that happened because you maybe already were, instead of having your feet like hip width apart, uh, with your, with your feet forward, you spent too much time like walking like this for particular reasons. And a lot of people might walk like this, because their hips aren't quite strong enough, okay? So this stimulates my, my lateral sides, okay? So I'm really exaggerating, but that's a potential. Um, so, gosh, where was I going with this? <laughs> a lot of times if we can, oh, the knees, right? So, so maybe because I've walked so much like this, the cartilage, you have like two heads of your femur, right? but the outside femur got all wiped away because now instead of equalizing the pressure between our, of our kneecap, I had a lot on the outside for a long time. So maybe I injured my meniscus and maybe I wore out the cartilage. If I were to change the stimulus, which is to correct that my feet aren't like this, putting the pressure right there that I've equalized like this and then see how my knees collapse. 
That's gonna happen to a lot of people. Now I'm gonna build up the strength so my kneecaps are actually pointing in the right direction. That's going to be work at my hip, okay? And now I've changed that the, that the energy force coming up from the ground is equal in my knees then I'm most likely going to not feel pain in the area that has um, the lack of cartilage. They used to think cartilage didn't regenerate. And now they know that it has the potential for it. Okay, it doesn't mean that it's going to happen, but there is the potential. So if you were someone that uh, was starting to lose cartilage in the knee or you had some other inflammation, um, an injection that's going to create space. Um, like a, uh, there's the different ones that they might do is it's like a, a hyaluronic acid. There's other ones that are going to be more like a chicken fat. Um, that's what people call it. I don't know what it actually is. It's going to create a little bit of a buffer. So it's automatically going to feel better. But theoretically, if you had a little bit of time where you weren't rubbing right on that one area because you had space, um, then you might potentially regenerate some um, cartilage again around that area and sort of regenerate the area. Either way, if you went from all your pressure in, uh, you know, like, like on one side and then you equalized it, you're going to change the point of stimulus. It's not just going to be on the outside. It's going to be equal. It's um, similar to like when you wear a mouth guard. You know, people think of a mouth guard as just protecting your teeth, which is what it does. But what it also does is it, if you have a thousand pounds of pressure on this side and 300 pounds of pressure on this side, um, because of how hard you're biting, and people can actually do that then it's going to equalize the energy so it's equalized throughout the whole thing. It's quite beneficial, actually, for people that tend to need mouth guards. Any questions about, about that concept? It's really great what our bodies can do to regenerate. Similar things happen with, um, with disc issues in the back, um, bulging discs. And so... In Agoscu, which is where I got my postural alignment therapy, they make a big deal about it doesn't matter what your history is. It just matters that you get your body stacked up and start moving properly. And there is absolutely a, a, a point to that. People get a diagnosis. They get uh, emotionally attached to that. They start to feel like they're a victim. They have this. It's their thing. They're never going to get over it, right? Anyone could be in a better situation or a worse situation than you are right now. Always, 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 no matter how bad or how good you are. Um, sometimes, though, what your actual diagnosis was, did you have a bulging disc? Did you have a herniated disc? Did you have some of these other things? We'll give you a clue of why you're in the pain that you're in, not because of what you had, but because of what happened to happen in your body to get where you are. And it also gives you a little bit of a, an anticipation of what, how much time it's going to take to feel a little bit better. Is it simply that I do a couple of foot or pelvic exercises and my knee feels better? Or do I have a herniated disc? Now, a herniated disc, okay, is where... Um, if you imagine that the disc is like a jelly donut, okay, and a bulging disc is the jelly donuts pushing to the side, and a herniated disc is that the jelly donut left, the jelly left the donut, okay? You create a lot of inflammation when the jelly leaves the donut because the body goes, whoa, this is a foreign object, okay? And so it's, if you know you have a herniated disc, and it's not, it's gonna be a while before you feel better. You can absolutely start to feel better, but you shouldn't necessarily think that you're on the wrong track if it doesn't happen overnight. Um, what other things? Anyone have any more questions? Otherwise I can keep talking about stuff. I love talking. I just get on so many tangents that uh, <laughs> I lose track of stuff. I heard a pause, so I don't know if anyone was going to ask something.
All right, so we have about another 15 minutes. Let me think about some other things that we could talk about. Um, there are things in here, there are, there are issues that people have that are so incredibly common that it's become anticipated that everyone will have them. Um, for example, issues with incontinence as people get older, okay? Um, or that um, you're going to be in a lot of pain as you get older or some of these other things. And um, they are incredibly common for many different reasons. And, um, but they, I think it's important for people to realize that they're an incredibly common dysfunction that could be corrected. And it's not always super easy to correct it. Um, but uh, one of the reasons why I really wanted to get into education about this stuff is because I felt like um, people had the opportunity to improve their life and their body to the best of ability. And people thought that it wasn't within their means to be able to do this. And, and I am referring to general where now I'll get a little bit into pelvic floor. So it used to be that uh, people with uh, pelvic floor dysfunction, um, bladder control issues were thought to be um, just common for women who had given birth, issues with coughing, all sorts of other, other issues. And then it started getting more common in, in a larger group of people. It wasn't just older women anymore. It was starting to be younger and younger, very athletic people. So then it got to be common that, oh, well, if you're a young athletic person, you're going to have this issue as well. The issue potentially is um, that your muscles don't work together in unison. When you have, um, and my one of my favorite people, if anyone has this issue or if you know anyone is having this issue is a woman named Julie Weeb, W-E-I-B-E. -E. She has a lot of stuff online. She works, she was a physical therapist who then worked with pelvic floor dysfunctions primarily because she worked with athletes and she started to recognize that athletes of all ages had incontinence issues. Um, and <clears throat> she works with um, the core and the breath to improve um, either pelvic floor issues or core stability in children who had, say, um, cerebral palsy. So someone with cerebral palsy will have a hard time with uh, the stability of your legs um, to be able to, to have the core stability in the body and then the core stability in the legs to walk. So ironically, pelvic floor and ability to walk are a little bit um, tied in because, and I've talked about this a little bit before, the true core, if we're going to talk about the true core, is going to be the four elements that are pelvic floor on the bottom, my diaphragm on the top, my deep transverse abdominals on the front, and then my back muscles on the back. And these are like family members that have to play nicely together. And a lot of times they don't. So what, what often tends to happen is, um, so like the, the top, which is the, the diaphragm, will often never let go. And if you imagine that there's like a, um, a balloon, it's much easier to see if it was a balloon, right? But if you have a balloon on the top, okay, and you're constantly pressing on the bottom, the bottom of the pelvic floor is going to bulge, right? So a lot of times um, people could improve um, bladder floor dysfunctions by making sure that you're breathing correctly on the top, that your, um, that your true core, which is the diaphragm, pelvic floor, um, deep transverse, and um, stomach muscles are all working together properly and or using your breath correctly when you move. And using your breath correctly when you move can also be a strategy 
for compensations for people that have natural deficits in their core, like someone with um, cerebral palsy. So should you hear of someone that really talks about um, pelvic floor dysfunctions? And of course, everyone has those, right? Extremely common, many people have it, but there are things that you can do that are either going to get rid of it or improve it. So um, send them, I, I'm not an expert in this, but I love to educate people about where they could find the information should they want that. All right, I'll give it a minute to see if anyone else has questions. Good morning. I, I have a question about lower back pain. If you uh -huh. sit at a desk all day, what do you recommend is the best method to, besides those stretches that you talked about, mm -hmm. is there any other tip that you could suggest? I mean, getting on the floor, doing hip flexors and, you know, what is the best connection that you can make to avoiding intense back pain if you're not sitting properly? So are you saying that, do you have uh, the back pain at the end of the day or the beginning of the day? End of the day. Okay. So next class is uh, going to, I was going to do a little routine for the end of the day, um, but there's a couple of different things. I did a whole class right at the beginning of the pandemic that would have been filmed that was on how to sit better at your desk. So it was how to sit better, how to set up your desk better, because it's not just about your back. It's also about your eye level, your head level, how your back is, right? So that would be beneficial, but I'll make, I'll make a quick demonstration of, of the different things that you could do that are going to improve it, okay? So one thing is if we are sitting, okay, we're going to want to make sure in the ideal world, that our hip is sort of at a right angle, our knees are about hip width apart, and our feet, you can't see it, but my feet are about hip width apart with my toes pointing forwards, okay? Now I'm gonna go on to the side so you can see this as well. So now I'm gonna sit back in the chair. A lot of people sit forward and kind of slump like this, okay? So now I'm going to kind of sit back on the chair. I've got my sit bones underneath me. I can feel left to right and go, yep, yeah, I'm probably equalized in my pressure between the two. I'm right here, okay? If I find myself slumping too far forwards, it can be very helpful. This is not what I would have the pillow look like necessarily, but I'm going to perhaps, okay, but a little bit of a support behind my low back. And as you can see, that's just going to make me sit upright a little bit more, okay? So now I get to neutrally maintain a little bit of a hip flexor right here with a uh, little bit of a curve in my back, which is where I'm supposed to have a curve. And then my upper back is able to be neutral. I want to make sure in general, okay, that the computer screen, if, if that's what I'm doing, working on the computer, my head, my eyes are able to be level um, in here, okay? And I ideally want to be able to set up the keyboard and the, the mouse that my shoulder is able to be neutral. Now, it's really rare if you are on a, um, <clears throat> a laptop, okay, that the screen and the keyboard are adequate. And as long as you generally, okay, keep your eyes, whoops, I get caught in a hole. As long as you generally keep your eyes neutral versus this, or my head is forward or angled, okay, I can keep my head neutral and just roll my eyes down and look at my screen, okay? So it's not like you can't move at all, but getting your body set up throughout the day can be super helpful. Now, if you find your back hurts, not because you need that uh, support to make sure you're sitting upright and keeping your head upright, um, but because your hip flexors are really short, okay, I'm going to show you two things at the end of the day. Most of the people spend too much time in a slightly flexed position, sort of like 
this, okay? Hardly anyone is stuck in extension all day long. We tend to spend too much time with kids, with computers, with doing things kind of in a <clears throat> more forward position, okay? So if throughout the day, gravity pulls us into this more flex position, then we wanna allow gravity at the end of the day to neutralize it a little bit, okay? In <clears throat> next week's class, which I'm gonna go over an end of the day routine that can be helpful, it's almost always going to introduce my favorite exercise, which is static back. So all day long, we've been sitting, moving in a more flex position with gravity pulling us forward. At the end of the day, I'm going to get down on the ground and allow gravity to, uh, to relax myself into the ground. It, it is helpful. You can be on mats, but it is helpful to have a firmish ground versus a bed. A bed is going to be so soft that I'm not going to have my weight against gravity. So what this is going to do is it's going to level my head. It's going to undo some of the rotation in my shoulders. If one shoulder was more forward or one hip was more forward because I spent too much time writing to my left or writing to my right or doing the mouse, it's going to level my, my shoulders, level my pelvis, allow my low back to relax and uh, and everything is going to align, okay? So gravity is now working in our favor to reduce some of the negative impact that we had all day long. Now, if you are someone that sits and your hip flexors get short, and even right here, my hip flexors are short, okay? My hip flexors attach to the front of my back, but like on the front, okay? And then into the hip flexors. And so this is a shorter position, but if, if you are someone that you're sitting, your back is okay, then you go to get up and that's when you feel your back hurt. And if there's like a tug from the front, um, then th your hip flexors might be tight, okay? And they stay short. But then you can come here and I'm gonna keep one leg up and put one leg straight. And I don't know if you can see it, but my foot is, there we go. My foot is gonna be active, but it's on the ground. Okay, this leg, my hip flexor is stretching, okay? So now I'm reminding my body that this one can be flexed, this one can be extended and let it release, okay? Sometimes people have to progressively do it. In other words, I have something that um, in Nagoski was called the tower, but I might have it resting, not holding up like this, and then my back will relax, and then I work my way down to here. Okay, then you do the other side. So you either have it all the way down on the ground, and I can feel that my right one is tighter than my left. Okay, and I already knew that, but, um, but I might want to progressively move it down if it was really tight. Because hip flexors tend to want to release passively. So what I just showed you was a passive way. I'm letting gravity to slowly let it release. And you know what's right for you, right? Is if your, if your legs are straight and you have an arch under your back, okay? If, you're, if you can have your legs absolutely straight and there is no arch in your low back as you lie down, then the hip flexors aren't tight on you. Okay, but if you lie down here and your and your back is really arched still, then you may have tight hip flexors. Um, the way that I showed you with the progressive moving down is how to passively do it and actively might be looking like this. Sometimes active is very effective as well. So I'm it's like this runner stretch. Okay, so now I'm going to move forward and the stretch is happening on this leg. Okay, so this is actively doing it because I'm asking the muscles to press into this movement. When I did it in the chair, I was doing it passively because I was allowing gravity to allow it to release. 